Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning for uh, Drive Growth by Digitizing Your Business. My name is Joan Mulvihill. I'm the Digitalization Lead for Siemens and I'm so delighted to be your host for the next hour. And we'll be talking to entrepreneurs from all over the country who are driving digitalization, growth and efficiency in their business. Today's event is hosted by the Local Enterprise Office for Dublin City. But with that said, we are delighted to say that we are welcoming attendees from every single county all across the country um, to this Spotlight event. Today marks the start of Local Enterprise Week across the whole country with hundreds of events designed to help you grow your business. To get us started, I'd like to hand over to Minister for Business, Employment and Retail, Damien English, TD, who is going to officially launch Local Enterprise Week. Welcome, Damien. Good morning, everyone. I'm here in Room 101 of the Department of Enterprise Trade and Employment. So on behalf of myself, the Town City of Radcliffe and Minister Robert Troy, I want to welcome you all to Enterprise Week and to thank you to Greg and the team in Leo Dublin City for the invitation today to be a part of the Spotlight event and to officially open Local Enterprise Week 2022. This is the first event of what is going to be an extremely busy week across the country and as usual, the local enterprise offices have excelled themselves in putting on a first class schedule. With over 220 events, both in person and virtual across the week, there's something for every business and for every entrepreneur. Tonight I'm at a retail event myself and I'm looking forward to that as well. So in recent weeks we've seen the return of physical events and I have to say, being at Showcase last week in the RDS, seeing so many amazing Leo clients and their genuine excitement to be back at an event, meeting people and getting the chance to meet buyers from across the globe was heartening to see and it was a great buzz about the place. So again, well done to everybody involved in that. While physical events are fantastic and really help to build relationships, we have seen how technology can help bring events to even more people. So it's great to see how Local Enterprise Week will continue to have national spotlight events online that are open to everyone this year. Again, this event has been a fine example of that. There is space for both virtual and physical events, and I think the Leos are striking the right balance this year. Two years ago this week, we faced into Local Enterprise Week 2020, with nobody realising what was ahead of us and the challenges we would all face personally, professionally, and with our families and our communities only weeks after that. There is no doubt that small businesses like yourselves have been significantly impacted by what has happened at that time. But many of you have endured the pandemic and, and, and stand here today a stronger business than you were two years ago. But that was a challenge for everybody and I want to thank you for all your efforts during that time. Many businesses like yourselves now are more agile, more resilient and better prepared for what the world may throw at them into, into the future. What you exhibited as small businesses over the past two years is inspiring. Many of you pivoted, you upskilled, you saw the business opportunities where none previously existed and took advantage of that and excelled. We saw companies who had never previously even had a website now selling to companies across the globe. This is one of many emerging trends that we are seeing and that will be explored and explained during Local Enterprise Week. It's an area we want to work more closely with you and to develop that online offering and the access to markets all over the world. As we look to the future, we have to take the learnings of the past two years and bring them forward into the next two and well beyond that. In a time when physical doors were shut, virtual ones opened and trading online is going to continue to be a key facet for almost all businesses. We continue to see an increased focus on sustainability and I don't doubt that will endure. The demands are not just the ones that regulators set or that we put on ourselves through policy, but those demands are now coming from our partners, from our clients, from our customers to be more sustainable in our business and our work practices. And that's a challenge I know we can all manage. Companies need to think long term and those that do that will understand that, that being more sustainable is going to be better for your business in the long run. It will help you build better relationships and will positively affect your bottom line by increasing your customers and your sales. In the past two years, the world has become a much smaller place. The increased use of social media and online sales tools means that we can now operate in a global marketplace. And this is opening new doors all the time and doors we want to help you open and go through. Internationalization and exporting are not just for large companies anymore. This should be the ambition of any small business and if you can sell it here, you can sell it anywhere. And again, we want to help you on that journey through our Leo network. 
These are just some of the areas that will be covered this week as part of over 220 virtual and in-person events. And today's opening event being hosted by Leo Dublin City is one of the most important areas around business at the moment, digitalization. It's, an, it's on part of every agenda we, we're discussing here in the department and right across all the government departments as well. This is very much a new space for small businesses, but like sustainability, it will be a key pillar for businesses well into the future. The benefits of going digital to your business are limitless and could have a transformative effect on how you run your business and how you grow it and how profitable it can be. It's not simply about being online, but using digital technology to enhance the performance of your company to increase productivity and competitiveness is key. Areas such as data analysis and cloud computing, along with process automation and utilizing uh, AI, will have a big impact on gaining a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So I would say to everyone this morning, enjoy this session uh, and please do stay in contact with your local enterprise office as they are best placed to show you what supports you need and when you need them, be that sustainability, be it trading online, be the digital agenda, be it going green, be it exporting, or even just getting that initial business idea off the ground. Take in as much of the week as you can. Be curious, no doubt you will. Ask questions and find out exactly what you need to know to make that business idea a reality or to help grow your existing business. This is the time to do it and the people to help you are out there. You just have to ask. Again, I want to thank you all for your time this morning and I want to I hope and I, and I want you to enjoy Local Enterprise Week 2022. It's a real opportunity to, to engage with our Leo network, but also to engage with colleagues like yourselves who run small businesses all over the country at these very, various events as well. Again, I want to re remind everybody that Leo network is there all year round. Uh, we've seen it, uh, the success over the last two years uh, through our Leo offices. We've reached many, many more companies than we would normally have, 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 been, have worked with. The Leo network want to continue to do that. They want to reach out to more customers in all sectors and find new ways to develop our relationship together. So again, that can happen through these enterprise weeks, but also at, at any given week, please knock on the door of your Leo office, make the call, make the connection, get involved, because that's, they're there to help. And on behalf of our department, on behalf of the technology here, we're delighted to be able to support the work that Leo, Leo offices do. So again, spread the word, uh, get involved in Local Enterprise Week, but more importantly, stay in touch with the Local Enterprise Office on a regular basis. Be you a startup, be you a company that wants to grow and expand, be you somebody with a new idea, a new concept, or someone that wants to take on an international market. The Leo office can give you that advice and that guidance you need. So thanks, guys. Have a great week. Thank you, Minister English, for officially launching Local Enterprise Week and getting us off to such a great start. I think um, that gave us real context for everything we're going to be discussing this morning, but also real context for all of the events that are going to be happening throughout the week. Um, but I'm here for the next hour and we have some brilliant guests for you. Um, this is going to be a session where we're going to have lots of chat and discussion. So uh, settle back, get your coffee and we're ready to get started. And uh, we're going to have an hour now where we're going to cover three real areas, which first of all is what is digitalization? Second, what supports are available to you through the local enterprise office, but also through other schemes? So what are the supports available? And finally, some real life case studies of people who have embraced technology, embraced digitalization and helped it to grow their business. Um, if you have any questions for a Q&A, you can uh, send them through, submit them via email to info at leo.dublincity.ie. That's info at leo.dublincity.ie for any questions that you might have. But first of all, our first entrepreneur, we're now really ready to get started. Our first entrepreneur in today's event is Richard Stafford of APRIDATA based in Cavan, just up the road from myself, because I'm here from Mullingar. Um, based in Cavan, Richard's company, APRIDATA, specializes in process automation and digital transformation. So who better to get us started in this conversation this morning? We're going to explore what we mean when we talk about digitalization for your business. Richard, you're so welcome. Thanks, Joan. Good morning, and it's uh, great to be here, part of this exciting event. I know, I'm really delighted to meet you actually, because obviously with process automation and digital transformation on your agenda, very similar to kind of what I do myself, but I'd really love to get your insights on what your experience has been in doing it with SMEs, the kind of challenges that they're facing. So why don't you talk a little bit about yourself first, and then we'll get into some nice questions and chat. Perfect. So as you mentioned, Joan, we are a technology services company based uh, here in Cavan. Uh, we provide 
automation solutions, data analytics, and we also provide digital transformation um, advisory services. But I think it's one thing to, to kind of relate to is we're an SME as well. Um, and we would have started our business cloud native. And what that means is we, we, we basically start started in the cloud. Our whole business is in the cloud. All our services, all our tools, everything we do is in the cloud. We also now operate remote first. So our employees are based in locations around Ireland and not necessarily we have an office premise here um, in the digital hub and cavern, but we effectively uh, support remote workers as well. So we've evolved in that journey and I suppose understood firsthand the challenges that are involved around collaboration and around managing processes, uh, particularly with distributed and remote employees. And then I think thirdly, um, effectively, the challenges we've seen in the last couple of years, we've seen an acceleration of businesses looking to automate. And I think the last couple of years have really driven the need for that. I think where there would have been an awareness uh, in, in a couple of years ago, certainly what we've seen, and, and particularly in the SME sector, just a real need to start automating processes and how to do things faster, better, quicker, uh, more efficient, and to get more valuable insight and make decision-making around uh, what, what their operations are, are doing. So really, there's, uh, we, we, we live and breathe like every other SME. Uh, we see the challenges and the opportunities, and more so the opportunities. We would take the approach of automating everything. Anything that can be automated, we automate. That's our philosophy because it can be done. And yes, we're probably more digital native compared to, I think it's it's relevant to say that there's a spectrum from those that are digitally nascent. So digitally nascent and all the way to digitally native. Digitally nascent is really where you've got organizations who are probably a bit more reactive, uh, don't have key digital efforts in place, a lot of manual processes, uh, extensive use of spreadsheets. Well, there's nothing wrong with them. They play a place in every organization, but maybe an over-reliance on those. And in some cases, lacking digital skills, just lacking the, the, the know-how. And I think in a lot of cases, it's the art of what's the art of the possible when it comes to digitalization. What does it mean? What does it mean for me? Uh, and there's a spectrum of SMEs out there um, on that spectrum of maturity from nascent all the way to digitally native. And the needs are quite different for each of those. I think, Richard, that's an interesting point. I mean, obviously, you're digitally native and um, this is very much your lived experience. But there are advantages to... Um, to being less, uh, I suppose, less advanced in that you have less legacy systems to maybe have to overcome. So um, can you tell us about some of the, I mean, there's a load of reasons people uh, shy away for this or they're reluctant, but I love how you said you focus on the opportunities rather than the challenges. Um, and if you're an SME owner, you're looking at things like return on investment and, you know, I've invested all this stuff in legacy systems and now I have to move it. Can you talk to me a little bit about some of the, the challenges or, as you say, the opportunities that businesses have and, and how they weigh far outweigh the challenges? Yeah, and I think it, you raise a very important point. I think often digitalization and digital transformation can be perceived as a cost to the business. And that needs to be turned on its head because really it's an opportunity and it's an incredible opportunity. Sometimes, you know, particularly as businesses scale, and I know we'll hear from some businesses uh, shortly that, that, that are scaling, uh, and it becomes a real challenge where you've got a lot of processes that are manually driven and they're perfectly fit for purpose when you're starting out. Absolutely. You know, you don't need to focus on that from, from day one necessarily. But as you try and scale, as you try to, to operate into more markets, as you try to up volume, if you're selling uh, uh, particular products, et cetera, that becomes a real challenge. And if you don't have the processes and automation in place, that can become a real challenge. So I think the way to look at it, there's, there's probably kind of three key areas that digitalization brings to the table. And the first really, and the most important one is customer centric and the customer user experience. You know, ultimately we're in business to service customers, whether they're consumers, whether they're the business to business customers, ultimately we're in business to service other, our customers. And there's an expectation these days around how customers engage with companies. 
And if you're not at the races in terms of their expectation of how they can interact with you seamlessly, how you understand them, how you understand their needs, then you're at, at a significant risk of, of falling behind. There's a, there's a level of expectation at customers that you now must meet. I, sorry, I know you're in the middle of three, but I want to interject there because this is a common theme that I've experienced as well across SMEs, but also even larger businesses too. There is this sense that we're digitally transforming, transforming to a digital business. Whereas my perspective has always been you transform through digital, not to. It is not an end goal in itself. And what you mentioned there about customer centricity is so important. It's that mindset at the start about how will this help me to deliver better value, a better value proposition to my customer? If it will, then it, you will get your return. But it's to focus on and being very clear from the outset. Because one of the questions I wanted to ask you is like, you know, where do you, where does someone start? I, from, from my perspective, it's always start with what is the value you are trying to add to your business, to your customer? What is the end goal? What are you trying to transform to? But it's, it's never to become a digital business. It is to become whatever it is your business does better through the technology. Exactly. And it's enabling. I think that's the bottom line. It's enabling. And effectively, when you look at the customer journey and the customer experience, what it enables you to do is get just a far greater level of insight into what that experience is, how you look and how you show up to your customers. And like these days, businesses is, is conducted through many channels. It could be an in face-to-face, -face, it could be online, or it could be, you know, through another intermediary. And how you show up is really, really important to the customer. Um, and being able to understand and see and analyze how you're showing up to those customers is incredibly important. So I would certainly agree with you, Joan. I think it's, you know, the customer piece is front and central. Like that's ultimately. So when you look at that, you'd say, well, do I look at that as a cost? You say, no, absolutely. I have to be at the races. I have to be there. I have to be able to deliver the experience that the customer expects and indeed exceed it because it's a competitive environment as well. So like none of us are in, in, in a business that's so unique that we have no competitors. So, you know, there, there's an element of a race there as well. And there's an expectation setting um, from some of the leaders in the market, maybe adjacent uh, industries that are leading and showing the way how this can be done. And we all have to kind of watch those trends, understand the expectations uh, that consumers have and move forward in the same way. I think that's a really... It's a really important point that you mentioned there about, you know, we all have competitors and, and Minister English mentioned it even in his scene setting just now was this idea that if you can sell it here, you, you should be able to sell it anywhere. And recognizing that our competitors are not just the ones that are on our doorstep, but they are coming from, you know, international markets also. And this is, you know, business is not a lifestyle choice. This is this is, you know, about staying competitive. And he also mentioned sustainability. And I love the fact that you mentioned digitalization there as an enabler. It is a huge enabler of sustainability. I doubt very much if anyone is going to get to their sustainability goals without a degree of um, digitalization and automation. Has that been your experience with the businesses that you've been working with? Absolutely. And I think it does depend. You know, sometimes it can be daunting. Like we, we I, I think the challenge at times is digitalization can be viewed as a technical thing, as a technology thing. And, and it's not, you know, like every SME business owner we talk to, they know their business inside out. They don't need to be technology gurus to, to actually operate in this environment. They need to know what they need to deliver the customers. It's enabling. The rest of it is enabling. And I think it's really key that it becomes an embedded culture within an organization. You know, this thing, digitalization, it's not a bolt on, it's not an IT project, you know, to deliver one piece of value, you know, maybe operate, uh, automating one process or maybe introducing one system, but it has to be seen as a continuum over evolving the business and becoming more and more enabled over time. And if you're at the beginning of that journey, You've got to look it out at the two, three-year roadmap. You can't just, you know, it's not a one-off project. Hey, we're done with that digitalization. Now let's get back to business. It doesn't work that way. It's a continuum. And I think we need to, sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, well, I was just going to say, it's the idea of treating it as a separate project rather than, I've just said there, it is the business. What I mean in that way is that 
we used to look at IT as a support function to the business. It's now operations effectively because that's it's, it's the means by which we, we literally run and operate the entire business. So it's much more front and center now to delivering strategy than something on the side. But one of the things that you mentioned there, and it always strikes home with me because I bizarrely, most people don't, well, People who know me know now, I'm not a techie. You know, I'm not a digital native. I'm nearly 50 years of age. I, I am not, you know, not grown up in tech and I can't write code. But what I do, it, what I understand is conceptually process where it all fits and the technologies that are there. So if you're a business owner now and you're saying, right, okay, it's okay not to know how to do it all yourself, but it is important to know how it works or, or the value that it can deliver. And it is really critical to know how to find the people who can help you. So bar the quick answer, which is phone you or phone me, what advice can you give to SMEs who are listening in today on where they would start with finding the kind of support suppliers, advisors that they need? I think, you know, to, to kind of step back uh, a little bit, I, I think the first step is for every SME to kind of look at the journey and, and map that out and understand where they are today and where they're going, where they want to get to, because it is a journey that takes some time and then identify. So, like, we would typically go through, you know, a seven-step process, you know. So, first of all, to map out what your digital roadmap is. And that's kind of just high level, kind of gets a common language, a common understanding of, you know, the art of what's possible, kind of look at where things are today, an assessment really of the maturity of the organization as it comes to digital technology and the, the, the application of it and the skills that exist in the organization. Then that's basically mapping out a roadmap. And that's kind of at a very high level. The next thing then is looking at what parts of the business to prioritize in the digital transformation process. Well, is that customer front end centric? Or maybe you have some key, like as I say, every SME owner I talk to, they understand their business inside out and they know where the problems are and they know where the challenges are. So it's weighing up where is the low hanging fruit? Where, where are the real opportunities here? And you've got to start small. You've got to build on it step by step. Begin with something small. This doesn't need to take a huge investment. You focus on a small area. You identify an opportunity that's a real challenge or opportunity in your business. And it can be either. Like you've got the efficiency process automation side, which tends to be more, more around the automation. And then you've got the customer experience side, which is more around the, the, the end value to the customer. So the second step is really prioritizing those business processes. I'm sorry we're only on step two because I know there are seven steps, but would you believe we have run out of time? But the good news for everybody listening and for you and me, because I want to hear the other five steps, is that we, you and I are catching up again at the end of this session to finish off this conversation and maybe reflect on some of the insights and learnings that we've gotten from the three case studies. So, uh, Richard, I am so sorry to cut you off there, but I do think it's actually a good wrap point in that there is a process, there is a step, and, and to look for that put it all out, the big journey, and then look for some of that low-hanging fruit to get started, to get momentum. And with that momentum, I am going to thank you so much. And I'll be back to you in a little while. Great. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Richard. That was really great. I'm so sorry I had to cut Richard off like that. But we have so much to get through this morning. And having now kind of set the scene a little bit in terms of what digitalization actually is and could look like in an SME, it's really important that we know what supports that you can access. So brilliant person to have uh, to take us through all that. The lady who lo knows more about it than anyone else, Mary McSweeney, Department Head of Enterprise at Leo at Dublin City. So I am now delighted to welcome um, Mary McSweeney to talk about the range of supports that are available to help drive digitalization in your business. Mary. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Very well, thank you. It's lovely to have you here and thank you so much. I mean, for Dublin, Dublin City, Leo, for, for hosting this morning and putting it all together um, with the team at Spotlight. So this is really great to have you here. And obviously, um, we're going to have some great case studies, many of whom who have accessed Leo supports. But for the people who are listening in who maybe haven't accessed them before, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that are available from, from the local enterprise offices? 
Thanks, uh, Joan. And uh, as you were saying earlier, you know, we're, we're kicking off local enterprise week. So there's there's 31 local enterprise offices around the country. So I'm based in Leo Dublin City, but each of the local enterprise offices provide a wide range of supports. Uh, so training, uh, mentoring, networking and financial supports. And they're all really designed to help businesses with the challenges they're facing. So we know that businesses are facing green transition, digital transition, and the need to export and be more competitive. Uh, and as you were mentioning earlier, you know, even meeting sustainable development goals and things of that nature. So these supports are, are there. They're all heavily subsidized. Some of them are, are free or, or low cost and they're, they're designed to support businesses on their journey. And uh, with the digital ones that uh, we would. Uh, primarily uh, have to support businesses um, would be the um, trading online voucher. Uh, so that's that's one that um, really responds to the changing consumer behaviour where both international and, and local consumers are looking for convenience and the, the purchasing of uh, goods and, and materials online. And the trading online voucher is specifically designed to help businesses uh, create a, an online e-commerce uh, platform. And um, so it, it starts with, as you were discussing there with Richard earlier, you know, just a, a session to talk to businesses about how they might go about that, uh, because we want to ensure that every spend is is well considered and, and is going to get the return on investment. And uh, so there's a half day session uh, that businesses attend in relation to that. So there's one uh, tomorrow in Leo Dublin City and that can be booked for free online. Uh, but each local enterprise office organises those. Uh, and it, the value of the voucher is um, it's it's 50% uh, of the investment. So it's up to a maximum spend of two and a half uh, thousand. And there's a number of things that will help the business to do. But it's primarily about getting them up and running and, and selling their goods uh, online. But it would also cover consultancy services or uh, digital marketing or other things the business needs to consider. That's great. And, and just one that was new to me. So I'm obviously very familiar with the, the trading online vouchers um, over the years and how they've evolved. But Lean to Micro, can you tell us, I'm very conscious of time, but can you tell us quickly what Lean to yeah. Micro is all about and how businesses yeah. can benefit from that? Uh, it I, I think it follows on very well from your discussion uh, with Richard. You know, it's there to help the businesses really chart that journey. They get to work with a lean consultant. They get to look at the areas that the business could improve on, where they can be more efficient uh, and, and where, you know, digitization could be part of that solution. So uh, applying for that would really give the businesses time to think about what they want to change. And I loved Richard's comment about the art of the possible. You're not just moving what you do today into a digital environment. There may be ways you can change processes, you can do stuff more imaginatively and then it will work for your customers, but also for your staff in, in a more efficient work environment. I think that's a really great point, Mary, because a lot of people think of lean just for um, maybe manufacturing or something, but it is all kind of processes and process automation. And again, digitalization is not just you know, a website and your digital marketing. It is all those internal processes too, many of which we will be discussing on the case studies that we're about to go to now. But Mary, thank you so much for that. And um, as I say, really great advice there for people, not only to avail of the vouchers, but to really dig in and get the supports that are there in terms of mentoring and support and guidance too because these are big choices for businesses to make and this is real money you know and we want to make sure not only from the local enterprise offices but from the businesses that everyone is getting a return on that so mary thank you so much again and uh, and thank, thank you, you to dublin city for hosting us all this morning thank you mary okay you. everybody um, so well, now we're about to kick on to the lively session of um, case studies. I love case studies. So we're going to get to dig under the hood of some really, really exciting businesses. Um, and our first one is um, our first one is Mark Loftus from paddybox.com. So many of you will be aware of Paddybox. If you've been sending goodie boxes to people, particularly over the last two years of COVID, with little packs of Irish goodness. Um, then Paddy Box is possibly who you have ordered that from. So um, supported by the local enterprise office in Dublin City, paddybox.com, um, brings goodness to people all over the world, to Ireland, by creating and shipping, I'm going to read this, wonderful boxes of Irishness all over the world. So talking digitalization, fulfillment and exports. Um, we're now going to be joined by Mark. Good morning, Mark. Hi, Joan. How are you? Good. How are you? Great, great. On a Monday morning, fresh. On a Monday morning, I um I should have ordered in advance. So, 
<laughs> Listen, um, you've obviously been quite on quite a journey. I can imagine over the last two years, but I am um, in particular. But what I really love about this Paddy Box as an example is that a lot of people, and I was always to have this issue when I worked in the Irish Internet Association. People always thought e-commerce was all about the website. And one of the biggest challenges, of course, is fulfillment. And actually, not about getting the order, but fulfilling that order. You have a great case study example on that. Why don't you talk to us a little bit and then we'll have a bit of chat on questions. Yeah, well, you, you gave me a great introduction there anyway, so thanks very much. Um, we basically send gift hampers full of all the most iconic, traditional, kind of well-loved Irish gifts and, and foods uh, all over the world. We've sent thousands and thousands of gift boxes and delivered to over 180 countries since we started in late 2017. Um, so if I just go into our journey slightly and, and into our digitalization as well, I suppose, um, like in terms of setting up the business, research was sort of key for me because I had zero experience in logistics, fulfillment, inventory, e-commerce or really any aspect of this business. So um, I spent so many hours researching, talking to people, as many people as I could. Um, and I met a mentor actually from the Enterprise Board in Fingal, which gave me a great bit of confidence in terms of setting things up. But um, our website was probably our first step into digitalization and there were a lot of challenges with that as well because we offer uh, a customized box so, so people can choose the items that they want to put in their box so um, it was pretty tough and uh, I suppose a lot of advice and consultation with our brilliant web developer at the time and um, we eventually got it up and got it live um, our first year uh, was all hands to the pump it was my parents kitchen so it was family neighbors friends anyone who was good enough to help um, and it was an amazing start really like um, but it was very very hectic we were not organized uh, to say the least a lot of things were done by hand and manually like the delivery labels uh, personal notes manifests pairing delivery slit or packing slips um, and there were huge challenges around the stock levels handling customer service queries and just even finding the time to to get the volume of orders out and packed uh, for Christmas time that year. Um, and luckily for my mom, we moved to a larger premises pretty much straight after that, that Christmas. So she was delighted and uh, we haven't really looked back since. Uh, fast forward to 2020, I guess we were, uh, we've learned a huge, huge amount and we've grown an awful, an awful amount as well. Um, and we've just improved so many different processes in the business. Um, our, our delivery system is now fully digitized and it's transformed our business altogether. So like we work closely with DHL. Um, so we've integrated our delivery system seamlessly with our website uh, and it just cuts the man hours totally. So we're actually working with them as well to digitize our customer service interactions with DHL. Um, so we can find solutions and answer our customer queries a hell of a lot quicker. Um, so we're actually we're known for our customer service, so we do constantly strive to improve that, and it's such a huge part of the business now. Um, we we did a full audit of the of the website in 2020 as COVID kind of saw us grow by about 500 percent, which was excellent and, and it was great, but it was very very challenging, and we had to adapt very quickly. So um, after a lot of consultation with kind of different business owners and e-commerce people, we went to a platform called Shopify. And that's allowed us to scale the business um, and to bring the amount of order, the, the, the quantity of orders and all those sort of different processes. Um, it's allowed us to, I suppose, to grow with that, with the, like our growing market. For example, now we have like automatic templates for personal notes and greeting cards, and they're all printed at once with the packing slip. So it, it just cuts a huge amount of man errors. Wow. Um, and we, we actually got the trading voucher for that as well, which is brilliant. So, um, it was such a good help to us. I love um, how you keep calling these man hours when it was your mammy hours, really, that we're talking about, isn't it? At the beginning, yeah. And yeah, she's still the, mammy the hours. control <laughs> officer, you could say, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, with all that you've automated, you probably are. You probably now know the answer to the, the great question, the last secret of Fatima and everything, which is, you know, when people are already putting paddy boxes together, do they choose barriers or lines? When they're sending tea internationally, do you have the, I'm just thinking about the data that you must have on the inside of the Irish psyche for sending stuff abroad, which are the real brands? Uh, I'm not yeah, going to answer that like, question. Yeah, well, look, Barry's is the winner. Um, it's, it's, it's by quite a long way as well, actually. Um, you, I don't know, you'd probably be, sort of, the dubs out there would probably be surprised to hear that one. Uh, but Barry's is by far the more popular one. 
Okay, good to know. Well, you know, we'll keep that as a secret just between ourselves and <laughs> everyone who's listening in. Um, but those kind of customer insights, I mean, I know we really want to talk about fulfillment, but you've covered it so well there in terms of everything that you've been able to automate so successfully. But do you see in terms of growing your business now, and just in light of what we've just discussed there with Richard, this idea of customer insight and data, you must be getting some really rich data now over the last couple of years. Absolutely. And that's, again, like getting that data, we, like we've the new platform and a new website has allowed us to grab that data a little bit better and to get to know our customers a lot better. Um, and with the customer, just, just interacting with our customers and not automatically selling to them all the time, we can now get to know them and build a community, which we've sort of done. And it's so, so important. And, and to actually speak to your customers and, and get the feedback to what they want to see and what they want to see in a, in a new product. So we're kind of bringing all that that feedback and all that new data that we're able to get um, and building our product range through that and being able to diversify into different sort of gifting sectors, which is it's really exciting for us because it's sort of endless because there's so many great Irish businesses out there that are doing all, a lot of new things. So it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's really exciting. That is really exciting. I am very conscious of time. And Paddy Box just seems to be quite literally the gift that keeps on giving in terms of um, yeah. those additional products. And, and and I think, too, we've gotten back into that lovely habit, I think, of sending things to people and putting gifts in the post and just understanding the, the sheer joy that has brought to so many people having something arrive at your door that's not a bill. So um, thank you on behalf of all of us um, for that. And just so delighted Thanks, that you could join us here this morning. Best wishes to your mammy and I'm glad. Did she get a bigger premises too? Did you get her a new kitchen after all of this? So. Oh, she, yeah, she, she deserved it anyway. She did, she did a huge amount. Okay. She still does. So it's... Well, tomorrow's International Women's Day, so we'll celebrate the mammies then too. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us this morning. Thank you, and, uh And now on, I, if you've got any questions again, sorry, I meant to say that, just uh, please do... Uh, do submit them online um, and for anyone who wants to check it out that's paddybox.com and uh, send some goodness to somebody maybe coming up to Easter or birthdays or anything but enough of that we are now on to more gifts more goodness um, our very next case study is Kate Park Kate has a business called bareessential.ie um, a naturally beautiful skincare range Another B2C business, Kate has used digitalization particularly to grow her business. I think around the CRM space, it's been really useful for her. So I think this is going to be a really, really interesting um, case study and example. I'm delighted to welcome Kate, who has been so ably supported by the local enterprise office in Kildare. So Kate, you're very welcome. Hi. <laughs> How are you this morning? Hi, Joan. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> you too. We spoke briefly on the phone the other day, so it's nice to put a face to the name and to the voice. And congratulations, first and foremost, on Bare Essential. I mean, it is absolutely beautiful. I've been on your website and you and I were chatting and we're both artists at heart. So uh, it's lovely to bring that kind of creative side into your into your business. Um, but before we get started, and I, I know you're just dying to do this because uh, your window. So I would like you to take the next minute or two just to tell people a little bit about your beautiful products um, and your business. Okay, so uh, yeah, we are based in Athai, County Kildare. Um, we, I founded the business in 2014. Um, I was very keen to start a business that was um, ethical, sustainable, that I could have, um, you know, that was handcraft. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, the, we now create a range of uh, handmade soaps, uh, luxury handmade soaps and skincare products. Um, we have uh, five ladies working on our team. Um, we wholesale mainly, actually, most of our businesses are wholesale to over 150 outlets um, internationally. So uh, we've just started growing our market in the U.S., we also um, supply uh, the UK, um, France, and um, Ireland. Um, most of our business was um, to um, gift shops and galleries. So we were very affected through COVID, actually. Uh, so we had to really rethink our business um, and uh, look at uh, B2C, uh, growing our online business. Um, and also because we are a handcraft business, um, 
we have to be very efficient with how we use time. And I suppose really that is why um, digitization has been uh, a very important um, area for us to focus on and grow and develop um, skill sets in. Um, really, as you say, um, the customer relationship management side of things, um, especially as we're growing, it really helps us to um, give our customers the best kind of um, service that we can um, and keep that very much a kind of a personalized service because we're very much, um, each person is um, an individual and we want to keep that, you know, keep the sense of the small business as we grow and customer contact um, of a high standard as we grow. Um, I think that's lovely. I think it's very clear, Kate, that your that the ethos of your business is lived through everything that you do, from the product design to the you know the essential, excuse the pun, the essential of the product, but also then in maintaining that relationship directly with the customer. And there's often a sense that when we when we digitalize something or when we introduce the technology, we somehow put a barrier in some ways or distance ourselves from that interpersonal connection. But for you guys, that CRM system, that digitalization has really helped you to improve that relationship with your customer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That journey to... to, to... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, just that journey Um, in terms of... You're moving to a CRM system, the complexity of that, the challenges, because a lot of people are kind of maybe possibly a little bit afraid of taking that big step and losing control of that spreadsheet, you know? And so when you move to a fully integrated CRM system, what were the kind of challenges, but more importantly, what were the opportunities that that brought to you? Well, I would say the challenges really were are um, very practical ones. So it's like cleaning our data so that we could input information into the system. Um, That takes a lot of time. And what we're really trying to do is try to save time. So there was the kind of initial, and we're still going through that process of setting that up. Um, But the reward is um, we can follow our customers, have a history of our customers, know what it is that um, they need. We can also save time. I suppose a lot of it is saving time in, you know, have uh, templates where we can respond to our customers quickly and efficiently. Um, We can um, also, I think the other side is not just about the customer relationship management side of things, it's also that we can um, look at data, see what is successful, how things are growing, where there are gaps in our knowledge, so we can create um, analysis. I suppose it's giving us a lot of data that we can analyze and it can help us also direct our business more effectively. Um, And the other thing is, yeah, I think it's time management too. So once we get the system set up, we can use more of that time to put into the actual handcraft side of the business. So that's one of our greatest challenges is we're very much, it takes a lot of time so, so that we can still be small, we can be nimble, we can be quick, we can put the time into the the product and the presentation and then the other side of the system, um, the digital side of it helps us actually be efficient and lean and nimble um, and compete compete in a very busy um, uh, environment, especially skincare. Spoken, and, and spoken like a true artist. The people who want to do painting but they don't want to have to do the website or the selling of the product going, oh my God, I'm not in this to do admin. I really wasn't. I didn't. I want to focus on the product. And again, just that, just your product is so artful and so beautiful and that sense of it being handcrafted and being able to bring your creativity and the ethics of your product around sustainability and invest the time in that, in the core of what really makes a difference to your customers and why they're choosing you is not based on your system. They're choosing you. And it's the conversation we have with Richard at the very start. It's like, it's transforming your business through technology. It's not to make it more technical or more bring more technology into it. It's to transform your business so that you can grow, reach more customers with more products and spend the time there where you're going to really get that return and free up the time from the stuff that really shouldn't take so long when there are great solutions out there for you. And you obviously have a great relationship with your local enterprise office in Kildare. They must be so proud of your, you must be so proud, but they must be so proud of your business. I mean, 
to be selling internationally like that, US, France, the UK, you know, as well as the domestic market, that is a huge achievement from from a thigh, from anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little um, bit, with about a minute to spare, what would be your top tip for businesses maybe engaging with their local enterprise office? I think just pick up the phone and call because they are incredibly um, responsive. Um, they listen, um, courses. I suppose the other thing is um, they really, they reach out, but they also help you meet your peers, which is a really help. Like it's really, really important that you know that you're not out there on your own, that you have other people that are in a similar situation to you. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's just so important as well to feel there's some kind of uh, measure of your progress, recognition of your progress, as well as them helping support and you know your progress and and lead it in fact. Um, so I would not hesitate personally to, to to reach out and just contact, pick up that phone, and and make a connection. Well, Kate, thank you so much. And uh, and I'm sure that would be really good advice, though, for people. I think moral support in anything, as well as just that advice, but as you say, being part of a group, a network of people that you can pick up the phone to yeah. can, that can help you through the journey, because um, it's not always easy, but it is an awful lot easier when you pick up the phone and ask for help. Kate, thank you so much, and congratulations again. And, uh, and everyone thank can you. check out your business on bareessentials.ie. So uh, please do that. And again, if you've got any questions just email them into us okay thank you very very much thank you and now Bye. we are on to our we're on to our final case study gosh the time is just flying by now this is something i never thought i would get the opportunity to do which is to talk dairy farming to a business in dublin um, I'm living in Westmeath. I am a farmer's daughter. So I was quite surprised to find out that Concept Dairy are actually based in Dublin and are uh, supported by the local enterprise office in Dublin City. Um, a pair of entrepreneurs running a dairy business from the city centre. Um, to find out more about that, I am going to be talking to the two founders, Dermot McColgan and Jacqueline Fitzgerald from Concept Dairy. Um, I have the app on my phone. They made me do it. No, I want to do. I was deadly curious, but I don't have a hard number. But anyway, um, Dermot and Jacqueline, you're very welcome. Hi. Hi. There Thank they you. are. <laughs> Delighted to hear that you downloaded yeah. the app. Thank you. I, I yeah, have the app. I did not manage... I didn't get managed to get hold of any of my dairy farming friends to get hold of a herd number to check it all out to pretend I was a dairy farmer over the weekend. But I, I will do, but, but you know, just so you know, because... If anyone listening in, rumour had it that I was going to get a pop quiz later on on dairy prices. Now, I've done my research, and according to the Irish Farmers Journal, dairy prices, milk prices are going to hit a peak of 60 cent a litre later this year. Boom, boom. And I've, no I've noticed that the latest prices for January, February seem to be around, wait till I get this right, 41 cent a litre. And that's yeah. including your um, lactose bonus and VAT. Um, and that is... Um, with a fat content of 3.6% and 3.3% protein. So am I in the well, right ballpark on dairy prices? Very good. There's Big a, there's thumbs up. Well done. Very well done. There's a little bit more there in the ballpark. Never let it be said I have rocked up to one of these events. Never let it be said I've rocked up unprepared. So I've done my dairy. <laughs> I've done my dairy back homework. But listen, less about dairy in general, more about you two. Um, I'm just going to sit back for a moment Everyone else, <laughs> go put a big dollop, maybe a full fat milk in your coffee. Um, I apologize if you're vegan, whatever milk you're having. Um, put some milk in your tea or coffee and listen to these two talk concept dairy for three minutes and then we'll get into some Q&A that does not involve meat pop quizzing on meat dairy prices. <laughs> go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks, John. Brilliant. Um, yes, so we realize there's a problem in the market so from a dairy farmer if you're a dairy, you have no idea what price you're going to get for your milk so let's say we're in march right now you won't know what price you'll get until the middle of april next month so every month the farmers go into the, what we call the milk price casino and they could get 44 cents as joan just said or 30 cents if the markets collapse and so what we did was we combined all our knowledge from the markets i used to work as an oil and gas trader in london and what we've done is we've taken all the information from the old global markets and put it into a hopper 
and then into an app that a farmer can actually just see what the milk price is worth up to the next two to three years into the future. So it really helps farmers see exactly what the price is and then give them some ability to plan for the future, some financial stability, because at the moment, we're especially with the situation in Ukraine, we really need our farmers to be keep producing food for all of us. And one of the crucial things and the reason we looked at uh, digital as a route is because I think there's a bit of a, um, a misconception that farmers won't adopt technology or they're technology resistant. But actually what we found is that farmers need accurate information. And at the moment, a lot of the information that they're being given is is historical um, and historical information does have some value but when we were looking at how the supply chain is working we realized that for farmers to be economically sustainable and secure they need to know how much they're getting for their milk and so we looked at how can we give information into the future um, so previously um, you might have looked at a text messaging system but we realized that we want farmers to have a better quality information that's more accurate more up to date so we have using the the digitalization support with the leo we were able to really simplify the the face of the app so we have a farmer app that allows farmers to see what their milk is worth for up to two years into the future. Um, and then working with their processor, then they're able to lock in that price for up to two years into the future, giving much needed financial security that is just so hard to come by at the moment. So if we, everyone's talking about sustainability at the moment, and there are three, three parts of it, like a three-legged stool, you've got environmental, we have social and we have economic. And everyone's talking about environmental sustainability and a little bit about social sustainability, but nobody is working on economic sustainability. So how, how are the farmers going to be able to afford to pay for all these various different initiatives that are being thrown at them by the governments all over the world? So that's one thing where we, we, so we would tackle that bit straight on. Uh, probably one of the a little bit topical issue, but unless farmers are, are in the green, they can't. They they won't be able to uh, beat go green themselves. So they're one of the big issues that we we decided that we would tackle for the farmers, dairy farmers in, in Ireland, and then looking to expand into other countries over, over the next uh, six to nine months. I need to have a whole conversation with you guys on a day when we're going to have to talk about digitalization <laughs> because I I am so obsessed with all things. Um, agri-tech and in fact I'm even doing a short course at the moment at the University of Copenhagen on um, on global food strategies in the context of digital but also in the context of sustainability so it is a really really interesting area and it reminds me so much about what the guys in tree metrics are doing for forestry in terms of giving accurate information and data to to farmers. And I think particularly in the dairy sector where the capex is so high in terms of investing and in moving to dairy or increasing herd, that these are these are the kind of assurances that you even need from a financing point of view to get finance for things like that for growth. Um, but I want to, notwithstanding the really interesting uh, value proposition that you guys have for farmers, I'm thinking of the businesses that are listening in this morning and they have got this brilliant idea of how they want to bring something entirely new disruptive to the market so you guys must have faced some interesting challenges in terms of getting this technology built and um, making bringing this brilliant idea to fruition can you talk to me for the benefit of the people listening who might have that kind of idea what were the kind of things steps that you went through in that journey I think a uh, very good question. I think one of the one, one of the key things is are, is establish who are the main influencers in the market, and who are the main stakeholders. Who do you need to get buy in from? And that's one of the key parts to it. And what we really knew that, especially from Ireland, that all the farmers were all massive stakeholders in all the co ops. So we needed to get the farmers on board with our app. So that's we needed to create a farmer interface to get them to show them what we're doing. Oh, this is real. It makes sense. And then in the background, we haven't talked about it, but it's a risk management system for the co-op. So they actually know what their risk is and what their exposure is over two to three years into the future. But it's it's about probably identifying the problem. And uh, in terms of disruption, uh, we've been maybe described as uh, throwing the brick through the window of the dairy industry, but with a nice parachute at the back with the risk managers to helping the processors do it. So 
we, we are definitely disrupting, but it's also with the solution to actually solve the problem that we are disrupting. Yeah, I think it's always a challenge when you're building a kind of platform business like that, that understanding well who which, which side of the platform are we on? You know what I mean? And and it's not about choosing sides, but it's how do you bring those parties together and how do you build that proposition to make sure that you facilitate the onboarding as as easily as possible so that the concept will really, excuse the pun, really take off. Um, in terms of choosing uh, technology partners, did you guys build in-house or did you get somebody to do it for you? How did that all work? Yeah, well, um, we initially we were looking at outsourcing and then when the COVID pandemic hit, it, it became harder to, to do that. Um, and so we looked at how could we do this ourselves? Um, and so we built everything in-house um, with, we have our technical genius um, who, he's one of these guys who likes to read the code of websites. He doesn't really look at the front interface at all. Um, and so um, he was just a friend of mine. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Um, and so we've been able to build and tailor everything. And that has been so important for us because it has meant that every time we've put something out to the farmers and they've looked at it, they've tested it, we've been able to respond really quickly and tailor and make changes to the interface and to the type of information that farmers want to see. Um, so that being able to respond quickly has been really crucial for us. Um, and something that we are looking at doing is um, around how we... We want to give this information to farmers globally. So how do we push this out around the world? And a key thing is giving the technology to farmers in their own language. So working on how we translate things and, and get those translations pushed through really quickly into often quite localized colloquial language that farmers are using, you know, on farm. So um, well, I know some of that language very well. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all understand. So tell me, you walk into a local enterprise office in Dublin and um, in Dublin City even, not even, you know, in the farmery areas of Dublin, and you wanted to talk dairy farming. Clearly the local enterprise office in Dublin City, but indeed all of them, they're a talented crew that they can move into different spaces like that. How did you find that experience of going into a city centre enterprise office to talk about dairy farmers? Oh, they're very helpful. I think when, once we explain the problem, and well, it's pretty good. When you explain to somebody, okay, what you imagine what salary you're going to get, and every month you don't even know what you're going to get. You might get 500 euros more, 500 euros less, or a thousand. So that's what dairy farmers experience every single every single month. So we what we were able to explain it to them, and that and they're like, okay, I, we get you. So that's why the milk price is so important. Yeah, so it's it does, farmer salary. It does build a lot of trust, though, too, into the system. Because obviously um, your price can vary if you're fat, or you can be penalized if your fat content isn't right. And what you're testing for fat content and then what the processor gives back in fat content. So you've got greater transparency in that process as well, I take it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have we, we collect all the historical data as well. So we have a very good view of what's happening. And we're giving, we, we're giving the, the farmers a, a very good forecast on their cash flows as well into the future so and then the fat content as they as that changes then the cash flow forecast will change over time because the more fat you have in the milk the more valuable it is so exactly and um, these are things i know would you believe and um, i am going to get fired from uh, <laughs> from my gig here if i don't have with a minute oh gosh i don't even have a minute i really did want to talk a little bit more about the um um, I suppose that whole process of um, building the technology, but of course you built it in-house um, and you, but you did get a lot of other startup support from the local enterprise office. And I think the moral of the story for you, from you guys is that there is no end to the scale of ambition that your local enterprise office will have for you, nor indeed their, their range of their interests and supports that they can provide. So um Look, it's congratulations, guys. I'm sorry we don't get to chat more. I suspect we will talk again because you're now on my LinkedIn, my Instagram. I feel like I've just been assaulted. <laughs> you're brilliant. I love it. There's, I mean, two things in my life that matter more to me, digitalization and farming. I mean, you're totally my sweet spot. So thank you both very, very much. And uh, we'll talk again. Guys, that was just super. Um, right, everybody. Gosh, time is just 
chundling along, chundering her along, and it's now half past ten, and I'm back with Richard now, Richard. You are at point two of the five-step program. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Wasn't that, I mean, those case studies are just brilliant and just the diversity of them. Yeah, you know? re- re- remarkable. And I think it is actually quite interesting. Um, the first one there, Mark and Pally Box, I think the thread there in terms of the evolution of that maturity, he identified the first problem was fulfillment, process, dealing with volume, solve that problem, moved to the next step, wanted to improve the customer experience, understand the customers better. And you know what happened there? He was able to capture that data and now he's got the data and starting to look and actually understand his customers and tailor and identify new opportunities with those customers. So like it's a fantastic example of how he has moved from you know, initial level of doing things like hands-on, mommy on the kitchen table, to scaling a business and putting in, and he evolved as well. He started off with a basic website, as you would do, and then realized, look, I need to move up my technical uh, capability. A basic website and a hunch as to what will go in a paddy box. And yeah. of beyond the hunch now into that really informed insights that you get from rich customer data built up over time. And I think that's the, the bit that is, it takes time this investment and getting the data. And even then, what Kate was saying about keeping, getting the data clean, you know, we think we're doing our best, but, you know, there's nothing beats a fully, because Richard, you and I are a little bit biased, but nothing beats a fully automated integrated system for clean data, as opposed to things coming in from different spreadsheets here, there and everywhere. Just, and then you get to focus, as Kate said, on the essentials of your business, on what is really, really core and what is really, really important the product and the value that you're bringing to your customers. Absolutely. I think that really stood out with uh, Kate and Bear Essentials, you know, in terms of what's her value proposition, what she wants to focus on. It's an enabler for her to be able to do that, to really understand, give the best responsiveness and personalization to her customer. She's not going to be able to do that if she's running on spreadsheets that are got data stored in 20 different ways, as you say. So it's, it's, I think they're great examples of, you know, real testament of what it enables. Because sometimes people at the beginning of the journey, until you actually experience it, you don't realize the potential of what it gives you. It, 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 it adds value to your business as, a, as you go along, as you increase your, your, cap- your cap- digitalization capability as you go along. I also think, too, one of the challenges that Kate must have surely faced when you think about it, she was largely B2B. Mm. To move to B2C, your order sizes are smaller, your number of customers are infinitely bigger. It must have been such a shift, particularly, as you say, running an artisan business where there's only so many hours a day, you can only make so much product. And at what point can you fulfill those orders meaningfully, you know, with a, exactly. and maintain, when I say meaningfully, I mean, maintaining that the quality, maintaining the customer service that you want to do, that must have been a massive shift for her. Yeah, and I think, you know, Paddy, Mark alluded to with Paddy Box earlier on in terms of the, the, the issues of dealing with that. So yeah. so pivoting in the middle of COVID, you know, but it, it also shows you, you know, the, the importance of having those systems and capability in place to allow you to do that and to actually enable you to do that. When, look, look at the, the, the environment we're living in in the moment, like things are changing dramatically within the space of days. You've got to have that flexibility to be able to adopt, change direction, move quickly. And the more agile and nimble you are, the more you're able to respond to what your customers need. Now, it behoves yourself and myself, Richard, obviously, not to go any further without talking about the fact that you're based in Cavan, where all the dairy farmers that I happen to know personally live. (laughs) So to talk about concept dairy, like what a clever, disruptive from starting from scratch and showing the power that technology can bring to just totally transforming an industry as well as, you know, um, they didn't do it. There's not a business transformation so much as a pure startup based on tech. And the idea that technology like that, digitalization, can allow businesses that do not exist in any shape, make or form to be born. Like we we talked earlier about that that kind of continuum of digital nascents all the way to digital natives. Concept Dairy um, is clearly a digital native, and he, he talked about that the metaphor of the brick through the window with a parachute. Yeah. But that is disruption. That's what disruption looks yeah. like, and, and these guys have really embraced that. And if you think about it, they have 
they're the true definition of a digital native. They are using, they are thinking about how to transform processes and transform industries using technology, using data, solving a problem in a different way that people just, you know, wasn't even possible before. And look, they're leveraging data. Data is their product. Data is effectively gives them the ability to be able to look into the future at market prices and predict future pricing and be able to bring that to the farmers in Cavan and elsewhere. Can I just say, though, too, what I love about that story and that example and digitalization and the power of it is that it really shows that, you know, there are huge opportunities for individuals, for small businesses, for the kind of business that is a Leo client. Do not be intimidated. The power of this technology can allow you to disrupt very big very established sectors. I mean, the dairy sector in Ireland is no mean feat, you know. The, the processes, processors, the dairy producers, the, the, they're big, large entities, co-ops, and the farmers then, by contrast, are very dispersed. But there is a, there's a role that that disruptive smaller business can play in all of that. One of the things that I always describe when I talk about digitalization is the three types. Uh, Alex Astervelder has three types as well. His are more uh, more finesse to the wording, but I call mine. There's the digitalization projects that are faster horses. You know that old adage: if you'd ask the market what they wanted, they'd have said a faster horse. There's loads of digitalization that businesses can do that takes as you said earlier, what they currently do, just do it better. And that is digitalization. It's just giving you a faster version of exactly what you're currently doing. And it is a legitimate project. It is a legitimate investment. It's a legitimate version of digitalization. But the ones that are more interesting sometimes or can give you a better long-term sustainability because faster horses will only keep you competitive insofar as everyone else is still on a horse. Um, but if everyone else is moving to a car, it's not going to be any good for you. So then there's the projects, the digitalization kind of projects that are innovative, that are the car version. So what, what do, what, where are the trends moved to in terms of what are the latest technologies available and staying, keeping a pace with that so you can stay competitive in your marketplace. So if all of your competitors are driving a car, you better not be still on a horse, you know? And then there's the other one that I call the disruption, which is more like concept dairy, which is a faster horse and a car are both predicated on your need to get from A to B as quickly as possible. Disruption is asking yourself, what are you going to be for? You know, it's asking yourself, what's the point of the journey? Why would you even need to do that when you could do something entirely different? So the, I always categorize them into those three pots. I, I tend, and I want you to disagree with me or maybe agree with me. I tend to think a lot of people go straight to faster horses when in fact, from an SME point of view, their return on investment is likely to be better if they go at least for the car version because they are probably have, they're going to change legacy systems anyway. You may as well go to the next model as opposed to the, the old model. Would you agree with that or am I off kilter? No, I absolutely agree with you. And the reason why is, you know, I think as we're all familiar with our own businesses and understand and look in or we're inward looking, it's a reason to be so like, I think classic problem an engineering type problem is engineers are biased to optimize things, you know, and to, to they want to really optimize things. And like, that's where automation comes in, et cetera. And, and, and that, can, that can yield results. But the first question is asked, should it be even there to optimize in the beginning? Should it exist? Should you be actually doing that and leapfrogging and, and, and going to, to solve the problem in an entirely different way? And I think that is, I think it captured that very well in the description of the three, those, those three categories. But it is down to that issue. It is, should you be doing it in the first place? And I think the advice I'd give to, to SMEs is you've got to stay current of what's happening, not just alone within your own industry, but also tangential. You know, what are other industries doing? Keeping abreast. And I think that's where the local enterprise offices, that peer um, that Kate talked about, that, that peer connection. What are others doing? And I think we're in a fantastic period of time now. Like, it's amazing. Like, I see around me here in the Cavan Digital Lab, you know, entrepreneurs springing up with purely digital businesses, you know, that wouldn't have existed five years ago. Like, it's a fantastic time to be alive. And you, that, they, they are everywhere within Ireland. They're not just concentrated in urban centres. So understanding and feeling that, you know, peer networks and understanding what's possible. And it goes back to that conversation at the beginning. 
knowing the art of the possible, because sometimes you may actually be solving the wrong problem. So knowing what's possible allows you to have a broader perspective and a broader scope of maybe a different approach you can make to your business. Well, I think that's one of the things that Minister English said in his opening address this morning. He he called on businesses to get curious, to stay curious. And and as you say, quite rightly, understanding what's going on in different sectors. I mean, immediately when I heard what Concept Dairy was doing, I thought of, oh, that's what the guys are doing in Tree Metrics for forestry. You know, so where are there different, where are there different businesses bubbling up and coming up that, you know, is there an opportunity to do something like that for the sector that you're in? And particularly, again, for SMEs who are looking at the, as I, I think it was Dermot who said it, um, the economic sustainability of businesses as well as the environmental and I don't want to downplay the, the environmental because obviously I have responsibility for that and Siemens too and environmental sustainability is hugely important but the, the economic sustainability of businesses and looking for where are the opportunities to to disrupt and could we totally change as you say the business that we're in by asking the question going well why are we doing this and uh, and what is the real value of this process that we're so keen to automate exactly and you've got to put yourself in the position to be able to join the dots you know because those dots will appear at random places and time and you've got to have that ability to connect and go oh actually hold on this is relevant to me like i think a lot of smes would probably struggle to understand how they could have a digital product or or what a digital product may mean in the context of what they're doing. But I think Concept Dairy is an example of a digital product. They're 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 exactly it's a it's a it's a traditional problem, farming, it's agriculture, but their product is digital. And a lot of businesses I think are going to see and learn over time that they have a value proposition within information, within the, the, the data that they gather as well. And they, they will have data products that they service with, serve to their customers in the future, definitely. I kind of feel like um, there's just so much rich opportunity. And I can only imagine the, the breadth of events that are lined up for the rest of this week, because we're just talking here about, you know, I mean, it is Enterprise Week and obviously digitalization is just part of that. But I think that one of the things that's becoming very clear in listening to you as well and and the case studies is that digitalization is going to have to run through almost every single event that's happening as the big enabler for for all of it. Um, So... (laughs) Again, I kind of stopped you on point two of your, was it was it five steps? I, I only ever had, well, I told you my three ideas of digitalization, and but you mentioned one of them there as well, which is, I always have three questions. What is your market going to look like 10 years from now? Not your business, because that's kind of largely irrelevant. It's it's only going to exist if where the market is going. So what's the market going to look like 10 years from now? And seeing into that future is really hard for a lot of businesses. But it's, as you said, and we said earlier on, it's the art of the possible. What could it look like 10 years from now? All bets being off, you know? And I think if anything, the last two years have shown us is that, frankly, anything is possible. Um, and so, things can change very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, 10 years from now. And then it's what your role going to be in that marketplace. And it may be very, very different. I always think, and again, up your neck of the woods, Kellett's of Old Castle. I know Tosh Kellett from a million years ago, and he always told me the story about his parents setting up that business or his grandparents' parents. And it was this, they used to make springs for carriages. And then they said, well, no one's going to be making carriages anymore. We'll make springs for beds, you know, but it was like, what's the market going to look like 10 years from now? There isn't going to be a market for carriages. What can we do? We make springs. Let's make them for mattresses. And it's a company I spoke to in Northern Ireland before lockdown two years ago. They make car exhausts. What's your market going to look like 10 years from now? Uh, Nowhere, because electric cars don't have exhausts. So you have to ask what the market is going to look like 10 years hence. And then what's your role going to be in that? And then what do I need to start doing now to help me get there? And I think Don't worry the, about being right or wrong on that market. Look, because no one's got a crystal ball, but you have to at least be keeping an eye on that. So, but I think you, you're right, and you've got to set yourself up for success. And I think one of the key ingredients of success is getting the right people in the organization, building your digital skills capability so that you you have that when that time comes and when those opportunities come, you have the ability to respond. Yes, you'll use partners, you know, where, to fill in gaps, but you've got to become natively good at digital as well and bring those skills 
skills and foster and, and basically nurture those skills in your own organizations over time. Because the reality is, I think in the not too distant fu- future, digital as a word will disappear because we will just all be digital business. It will be business. And the exception, the, the ability, the technology is coming on, you know, it's, it's not that far in the future where, where people will be building applications without having programming skills, like we're, we're, we're there today and that's going to continue to happen. And it's building that capability and those skills within your organization, setting the foundation for the future to be able to capitalize on those moments where you're, you you need to leapfrog or you need to take a that's, U-turn. That's a really interesting point, Richard. And it struck me when when Mark was talking and talking about Shopify and how much easier the journey is now than it was 15 years ago to set up an e-commerce business when you might end up having to write all your own code. It's so modular now. I mean, I talk about the fact that, you know, I'm a digitalization lead and I can't write code. I don't feel I need to know. I need to know how these, what are these, what are these modules? How do they fit together? And how does it help a business understand where it's going or get to where it's going and add that value. The technology is there. And I think one of the things that we have to do is just, as you say, it's that acceptance, it's that mindset of not looking at the, the, focusing on all the reasons why we shouldn't do this and all the challenges and the fact that there are loads of solutions, there are loads of skilled people, but there are loads of modular pieces out there that you put together like Lego and Absolutely. then quickly ironing out for your business. But that's what people like you are there to do and, and, and the local enterprise offices and the schemes that are there. It's to help people get those pieces all together. Yeah, right I, I think it's exactly that because there are things like AI, machine learning that's bandied around a lot these days. And for SMEs, it's like, you know, or data science, all of these. The reality is for, for, for businesses, that's going to be encapsulated within modular components like the Lego blocks. And you'll use it like a Lego block. You don't have to be a data scientist to use it. You can get the advantage of, of this technology. And we're getting better and better and better at delivering solutions to do that. So it goes back to the one thing I always go back to it's understanding the art of what's possible and then you know the future it's like you know being a child again you can get creative and build whatever you want to build Uh, you just have to identify the problem and solve it well that sounds to me like the perfect note on which to end I was doing so well on the timekeeping until I lost the run of myself quite literally in the last four minutes because I could chat to you for the rest of the day so I have to call a wrap on us now. Richard, thank you so much for coming back and helping me put together all those great case studies and into context for people who are listening in. You have been absolutely brilliant. I shall pop up to the cabin hub one of these days. Maybe we'll meet for a coffee in person. So lovely to talk to you this morning and thank you so much for everything. Terrific. Um, Thank you very much. I, I really do think it's safe to say I could stay on and I will be absolutely in so much trouble if I don't get to our last speaker very soon. But before I go to our very last session, um, I just want to thank, obviously, Richard, but also Mary McSweeney um, from the Local Enterprise Office at Dublin City. Again, go back to that little piece later on on the recordings and just make sure you know what all the supports are available there for you or look them up online. Um, Obviously, Mark Loftus from Paddy Box, um, from Cape Park at bareessential.ie, Dermot and Jacqueline at Concept Dairy. And um, and again, Richard, look, it's been just, I've just enjoyed it so much. I hope you guys have too. Um, so without further ado, my very, very last guest of this morning is Greg Swift. Now, I hope Greg remembers me because I haven't met Greg in a very long time, but I did used to know him when I was in my old in my old role in the Irish Internet Association. So I've given him a hint now. Greg, it's the same me. I look just older now and different, but uh, same person. Um, delighted to have Greg Swift, Head of Enterprise at the Local Enterprise Office in Dublin City for our final closing remarks and top tips. Greg, lovely to see you again. Hi, Joan. Yeah, really good to see you. Of course, I remember you. How could I forget you? (laughs) (laughs) No, I feel like I'm back in in Dublin 8 on Thomas Street and I'm just going to go around the war corner to to the Dublin City offices. But seriously, uh, thank you so much for today. I mean, your whole team, everybody, it's just been... I'm, I'm laughing, smiling from ear to ear. I've had such a great morning. But um, look, at, I need to ask you a couple of questions for the benefit of all the people who are listening in. Although I think it's almost a rhetoric question after the quality of what we've just heard is, 
But why should businesses take more time out of their week this week to join local enterprise week events? Give us your give us well, your best pitch. Well, well, Joan, look, I just think um, the, the, the event that, that was run this morning is a great example. Uh, if you take it, the, the, how interesting it was to hear all about uh, digital, what digital can do for your business. And, you know, you, you, you put it so well, I thought, you know, when you were saying, you know, that you really, you really have to look and use it for something that's really significant and, you know, use digital digitization in your business. And also, you know, that it becomes really part of your business, not just uh, something that you, that you, your term you use. I, I was sort of really picking that up this morning and I think it's so valid and the exciting things it can do, the way it can sort of transform your business. But just to say, you know, this is the seventh year of the local enterprise week. You know, there's 31 Leo offices across the country, loads of workshops going on all over the place. We're really excited about it. A lot of these events are free and subsidized uh, or heavily subsidized. You know, there there are a number of, of very big spotlight events coming up. Um, I might just run through some of those, Joan, if that's okay Me if I have time. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Just pick out a few. You know, straight after this event at 2 o'clock, there's one on food, consumer trends. At 7 p.m. this evening, there's retail for the retailers, adopting and innovating uh, tomorrow, you know, we've got one around exporting, getting people to export, look at internationalization. Uh, and then at 2 p.m., you know, we talked about lean competitiveness, so important. You know, the lean program is there for anyone who wishes to do it. We really want to encourage everyone to become more competitive. Uh, and as you mentioned yourself, you know, it's it's uh, not International Women's Day. So I know we're running a, a joint event with the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. Uh, a physical event, if you don't mind. So that's later on uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I know there's events going on through the whole country uh, to, to encourage female entrepreneurship. And then on Wednesday, we've got a green event first thing at 9 a.m. Uh, and then there's Agile. So everyone knows what Agile is. It's, it's, a, it's a great way of funding an, an innovative idea. You know, we worked with en Enterprise Ireland and there's significant funds available for anyone who has a super idea to, to work that up. Uh, and then at 2 p.m., you know, it's about intellectual property, how to, how to sort of look at into intellectual property, find out more. Uh, and then on Thursday, you know, we're back into digitization, I suppose, 9.30, you know, future-proofing your business uh, from the tech smart tools. Uh, and then at 2 p.m., social media, we can't get away from it, you know, social media, yeah. digitize, more <laughs> digitization, John. And then on Friday, you know, we'd be wrapping up with um, a boosting business online again, you know, more digitization. And then finally, the more very important, can't forget about money, you know, show me the money. So that's going to be at 2 p.m. on Friday. So there's a lot of exciting events. And that's only a sample of the 200 plus events that are going on throughout the country. And, you know, there's, there's many more. So, look, if, if, if anyone wants to register, it's www.localenterprise.ie forward slash week. And there's loads of activity, loads of events uh, to, to, to look at, uh, for that. So, look, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's, it's fantastic uh, to have the opportunity. And just to say, you know, from a Leo point of view, we want to see every, everybody, you know, even when this week is over, you know, I think you heard some of uh, the clients there mentioning, you know, there's the grants, the advice, there's the training, the the networking you know, for getting to see some of your, you know, to interact with your uh, peers uh, and signposting. The Leo office does a lot of signposting to all the other organizations that have uh, support for enterprise. I think that's... that's so John, really I suppose right, just... Right. It, it just leads me to just say to say a, a big thank you, especially to obviously the Minister English for uh, launching the event, to you, Joan, for doing such a fantastic job of the MCing. Thank you uh, to the speakers and the entrepreneurial panel, uh, to our own staff who organised the event uh, and quite nice events who made all the logistics possible. So, and a big thank you, obviously, to everybody else. You know, all the, not everybody else, all the entrepreneurs here this morning who took part and are, are, are here watching this. 
Greg, thank you so much. And so lovely to see you again. This has been quite lovely. I've had the best morning, honestly. What a start to my week. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, I just want to thank uh, Dublin City, Leo, for hosting us this morning. And I also congratulate everybody who's involved in Local Enterprise Week, uh, who's giving their time, whether they're entrepreneurs sharing case studies or advisors um, and professionals who are, you know, giving their best advice and support to businesses uh, throughout the week and the local enterprise office for coordinating all of that. Um, as Minister English said, and I just want to reiterate it again, because it's something that's really close to my heart. Be curious, attend as many as you can. You never know which of the ones is going to be the one that changes your business or where you're going to make that contact um, with the person who's going to be able to help you. So I strongly encourage everybody to look at that phenomenal list uh, that Greg called out some of the highlights there, but check out that full list on localenterprise.ie forward slash week share it to anyone in your network who you think may have missed it highly unlikely um but yes 200 events um happening throughout the week all over the country online and in person so um enjoy uh on behalf of myself thank you very much thank you for dialing in for listening for all the people who participated this morning and to the local enterprise offices um and best of luck on your digitalization journey Thank you very much.